Well, good morning, church family. We're so happy you're here worshiping with us this morning. Before we get started, I have a couple announcements I want to make. Um, tomorrow, here at the church at 630, we have a Stevens Ministry meeting. So if you've heard about Stevens Ministry and want to know more of what that looks like, um, that would be a great meeting to attend tomorrow here at the church, 630. And then the next couple Mondays of January, we have more meetings. Same time, 630, we have an outreach meeting the 24th, so that's next Monday at 630 here at the church. So if you want to hear the vision of the outreach team and kind of brainstorm with them um, for this upcoming year, that would be a great meeting to attend. And then lastly, the 31st of January, we have a missions meeting. Um, so same thing. If you want to know what they have planned for the year, that would be a great meeting to attend. And then lastly, Winter Life Group session starts not this week, but the next week. So it starts the 23rd officially. So that gives you a whole week to sign up for Life Group if you haven't yet. So with all that being said, I would invite you to stand with us and worship our great God. Lift 
Church. Um, as Micah said, my name is Seth. I'm the family minister here at the Fountain, and I'm glad to be able to just share uh, the word with you this morning and uh, just get into this. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm glad that you decided to come here and just decide to worship Jesus this morning and learn something new about him. If this is your first time, um, Welcome. Um, that's Connect After the Service. So if this is your first Sunday, I'd love to meet you afterwards. Um, I'll be Right down here or right out there, you'll find me somewhere. Um, If you're a young person, so if you are seventh grade to senior in high school, I'd love to see you tonight at Fountain Teens. Uh, We meet Sundays 6 to 8. We also just started a youth life group uh, every other Thursday. We had our first one this past Thursday, and it was great. If you love Just Dance, we played a lot of that. Um, And it was awesome. Uh, We got into Philippians. So I could go on about youth for forever, but... That is not why you're here this morning. We are here for Jesus. So I love our youth, but let's talk about Jesus. And to start off, I have a question for you. Who here has a friend who is always challenging you to try something new or go to a new place? Does anybody have a friend like that? Or are you that friend? Are you the person who's always getting people out of their comfort zone? People like me who kind of need you to get us out of our routine, get us out of the structure a little bit, say, go have some fun. Um, Well, if you were that person, thank you on behalf of people like me. But I want you to just to imagine that you have a friend like this, and this very friend comes up to you one day, and they say, let's go on a hike. And of course, they're so convincing as usual. They convince you to go to this park you have never been to before. They convince you to go on this trail you've never even heard of. And it's gorgeous. It's beautiful. The trail is amazing. There's a nice, comfortable, warm breeze. The sun is beating down on your skin. The birds are chirping. It is just a wonderful day. And your friend looks at you and they say, you know where the really cool views are? Off the trail. And you're like, I don't know about that. But of course, they're so convincing. They get you off this trail, and you were just kind of wandering throughout the woods. And it's so nice. You're seeing different wildlife. You're coming across different creeks. It's like, man, you were right, buddy. This is so much prettier. This is so cool. Nobody's really ever been this way. And then you start to wonder, wait, how did we get here? How do we get back? And at that moment, you're like, I think we might be lost. And so you look to your friend and you're like, hey, do you know how to get back? And they are saying, I don't. And so at this moment, the panic kind of starts to set in. And you're like, we got to get back to this trail. So you start trying to make your way back. And 10 minutes goes by. 15 minutes goes by. 30 minutes, 40. An hour goes by. And you have no idea where you are at. You are lost in the middle of the woods. And so you look at your friend and you're like, I just need to sit down. I'm freaking out here. I just need to get a moment to kind of gather my thoughts, gather myself. So you sit down. They hand you the backpack so you can get a a nice bottle of water out of there. You reach down and you feel something. What is this? You pull it out. It's a compass. You're like, thank you, Jesus, we're saved. You start looking through the bag a little further, and you realize there's a map in here. And you're like, this is awesome. This is great. We are no longer lost. We can figure out where we are. We can figure out where to go. But then you start to realize something. Your friend has had this the entire time. And you start looking at them a little frustrated, like, Why did you not tell me this an hour ago? We are lost. We have no idea where we are. And more importantly, 
why didn't we look at the map before we got off the trail? Like, you packed this map and compass knowing it was important. You had all of this knowledge, yet you just forgot about it? You just left it in this backpack? And so rightfully so, you're a little frustrated with the decisions that your friend has made. See, your friend had all of this knowledge so readily available and didn't share it with you. And that's frustrating. Your friend did not take the time to invest their knowledge in you. They had an incredible resource at their disposal, yet they chose to keep it to themselves. Actually, probably debatably worse, they just forgot about its importance. They didn't see the true value in the knowledge that they held, or they would have at least remembered it was in there. They forgot about the importance of investing the knowledge they have in somebody else to guide them towards the very thing that could bring them back to the path. And the Apostle Paul takes this idea of investing, imparting wisdom, discipling, whatever word you want to use for it, and he puts it to use in the way he disciples Timothy. See, at the culmination of Timothy's journey with Paul, Paul kind of writes him these two letters. So he writes him first and second Timothy as Timothy is pastoring this church in Ephesus. And he's like, hey, Timothy, here's kind of some challenges I have for you. Here's this charge I have for you. And we pick this up in chapter 4, verse 2 of 2 Timothy. It says, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. And as we read these words, on the surface, it is just kind of like, all right, awesome. This is like this charge that Paul is writing to Timothy. This is his encouragement, imparting wisdom. Yes, those things are true, but it almost kind of comes across as, Timothy, have you heard this before? Like Paul is choosing these things, and it's almost like, hey, Timothy, remember these things that I taught you. Remember these things you learned as we were traveling together, as you experienced these things with me. And so it's almost like Paul is kind of summarizing these things and saying, remember, Timothy, remember these things you learned. And it's some great advice. But it does beg the question of, how did Paul get here with Timothy? How did Paul get to this point to where he's writing these letters to Timothy to encourage him and equip him and remind him of these things that he already learned? How did Paul and Timothy get to this point? Well, I think to answer this question, we should go back to their first encounter. And that's actually found in Acts 16, when Paul was evangelizing to Timothy's hometown of Lystra. See, Timothy's mother was a Jew, his father was a Greek. And this is significant because, well, the vast majority of Jews didn't really think highly of the Greeks or Gentiles. Um, They weren't really their biggest fans. And Paul, being a Jew himself, could have easily written Timothy off because of his Greek or Gentile heritage. And many of the Jews during this time could have done exactly that. They could have looked at Timothy and said, you know what, you're half Greek, you have some Gentile blood in you, I'm not interested in you for that reason. See, the Jews at that point didn't really want the Greeks to kind of mix with what they were doing, and the Greeks kind of felt the same way. So there was this tension um, between them. But Paul, he comes into Timothy's hometown of Lystra, meets Timothy, and he recognizes, you know what, I see this tension, I know it's here, I have felt it myself, but I know that Jesus is bigger than our differences. I know that Jesus is bigger than the tension we may feel. And at this point, he makes a conscious decision to say, I'm going to begin investing in this guy. And because of his half-Jewish heritage, Timothy had been taught the scriptures by his mother and his grandmother. But he hadn't necessarily devoted his life to Jesus. See, Timothy, he had the head knowledge, but he had never accepted God's grace. In other words, Timothy knew of God, but he did not know God. And that is where Paul comes in. Paul saw something in Timothy. Paul recognized Timothy was someone who needed investment, 
and guidance. And with this investment and guidance, Paul knew that Timothy would be able to accomplish amazing things for the kingdom of Jesus. See, Paul saw an opportunity to pass on the knowledge he had to Timothy. To connect the scriptures Timothy had heard with the coming of Jesus Christ. To say, hey, Timothy, you've probably read and heard about this Messiah. He's actually come. His name is Jesus Christ. He experienced death on a cross for you. He rose again. He rose three days later. He conquered death in the grave. And so, Timothy, listen, he is here. Jesus is the Messiah. But Paul, he did more than just pass on his knowledge to Timothy. Paul invested in Timothy. He developed a relationship, a friendship with Timothy. And as a result, his life was forever changed. Who are you investing in? And so throughout the course of their time together, Timothy, he grew exponentially in his faith, as did his relationship with Paul. And we actually see Paul refer to Timothy as his true child in the faith in 1 Timothy 1-2. And what Paul most likely meant by this is that he is the one who led Timothy to Christ. So he was discipling, investing in Timothy, teaching him these scriptures, pointing them to Jesus, saying, hey, Jesus has fulfilled this. And then he led him to Christ. And what's so important here is that Paul, he didn't just kind of like convert and desert. He didn't just say, hey, Timothy, you ever heard of Jesus? Yeah, you probably have. All right, he's the Messiah. Great, accept him. I'm going to be on my way. Like, you just read your Bible. You can figure it out on your own, right? No, that's not the approach that he takes at all. Because, well, to be frank, that approach doesn't work out too well, does it? I can recall one time my wife and I, we were in Walmart. And this guy, like, randomly came up to us, handed this, us this brochure, and just, like, ran off. Like, there was no speaking. There was no communication. It was literally just, like, and he was just gone. It was, it was like that. It was really weird. And so we look at this brochure, and all over it is just, like, fire with this message of, like, do you know where you're going when you die? And now we were living in the buckle of the Bible Belt at the time, so... You kind of expect some of that every once in a while. But we look at this and we're like, yeah, we, we actually do know where we are going. Uh, we've been following Jesus for a minute here, but he had no way of knowing that. Because there was none of this, hey, let's get to know them, let's invest in them, let's start a relationship, a friendship. No, it was just hand and run. And that is what's, that's what made Paul so different. And his approach with Timothy. Paul developed a relationship with Timothy, a friendship. Paul spent time with Timothy by taking him everywhere and developing him along the way. When Paul has a vision about a man in Macedonia in Acts 16, he doesn't just rush off on his own. He doesn't say, hey, you know what, Timothy? Like, you've been with me for a bit, but you don't really know a lot. You're not that helpful. I know way more than you, so you stay here. The big boys are going to go to work. You, got, you just sit tight. I'll tell you about it when I get back. That's not his approach at all. He uses this as an opportunity to bring Timothy along and teach him. He continues to build that friendship. See, Paul could just leave Timothy at home. And come back, tell him all about his journey to Macedonia, tell him about this vision, but it doesn't really give Timothy any experience. It doesn't really give Timothy any stake in what happened. See, Paul, he knew the importance of investing in someone and developing them or into the person God wants them to become. They just simply did life together. And luckily for Timothy... Paul wasn't really one to shy away from challenging him. Uh, Paul wasn't really somebody who was quiet and reserved in that area, um, if you've ever read stuff by Paul. And so we actually see in Acts 17, 13, and 14, that says, But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea, also they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds, then the brothers immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea, but Silas and Timothy remained. 
okay, um, so what better opportunity for Timothy to grow than an angry mob? Um, I can't imagine, I'm kind of like picturing this conversation and how they really talked through their approach here. And I can imagine Paul just being like, all right, so they're mad. Um, they're not thrilled. So we've had this discussion, and I'm actually going to go over here. Timothy and Silas, you've got this. Like, I can almost imagine uh, Pastor Josh coming up to me and being like, hey, they're really angry. So I'm going to go on vacation. I'll be on the beach. Have a great time, buddy. Like, <laughs> I'm just picturing this conversation between them. It's, it's kind of funny. Um, but it's also a great learning opportunity for Timothy. Even though this was probably terrifying for him at first, Paul knew what he was doing. Paul's relationship with Timothy allowed him to discern when Timothy was ready for something like this. Without Paul investing in Timothy's life, getting to know him, developing this relationship, discipling him, he wouldn't have known when Timothy was ready for this. But he did. Because he invested. He knew it would stretch him, but he knew he could handle it. See, Paul worked with Timothy and slowly gave him more responsibilities. The relationship starts out as Timothy just accompanying Paul on his different mission trips. But eventually, Paul puts Timothy in charge of things like preaching to an angry mob, defusing that situation, and even pastoring the church in Ephesus. So Paul has taken a half-Greek, half-Jew, under his wing, intentionally invested in his life, and this young man is now in charge of pastoring a church in Ephesus. That's amazing! What a wonderful testament to discipleship. Imagine if Paul had never invested in Timothy's life. Imagine if Paul just kept all of this knowledge to himself. Where would Timothy be? Who would be ministering to the Ephesians? We don't know. Luckily, we don't know. But even when Timothy leaves Paul to go pastor this church, Paul still writes him two letters to encourage and equip him, First and Second Timothy. See, Paul's investment, it never truly stopped. It may have taken on a different form. It may have looked different. It may have matured. But the investment continued. The discipleship continued because for Paul, it was about the relationship. Paul didn't just dump a bunch of facts and information on Timothy. He took the time to invest and cultivate a friendship, a relationship that would last a lifetime. And lives were changed because of it. Who are you investing in? And when I look at the relationship between Paul and Timothy, it does make me wonder where I myself would be if no one had invested in me all the way back in high school. In my sophomore year, uh, somebody invited me to youth group, and I wasn't plugged in anywhere, so I get plugged into this youth group, and immediately the youth pastor sees me, and he's like, I'm going to take this guy under my wing. And so he begins investing in me, and he, do he started by just doing the simplest thing. He just cared about me. He just cared about me as a person. Like, he genuinely wanted to get to know me and cared about me. He took me out to lunch. He talked to me at youth group, texted me throughout the week. Um, and as that relationship matured, he started reading the scriptures to me. We talked about theology. I learned so many things. He invited me to do these internships with him. He invested in my life. He didn't just invite me to something and then just say, good luck. He intentionally poured into my life, took time out of his schedule to help me in my faith. And I can't imagine where I would be today if that had never happened. And I think it is safe to say that most of us in this room who would say we follow Jesus have somebody like this in our lives. Somebody who, like the Apostle Paul did with Timothy and like my youth pastor did with me, saw we needed investing. We needed discipleship. And because of my youth pastor's investment in my life, I get to now invest in the lives of young people and families here at the fountain.
See, it's this cycle where somebody invests in you, then you disciple, or then you invest in somebody else, then they invest in somebody else. And this cycle of discipleship continues. And before you know it, a lot of lives have been touched. Who are you investing in? See, this is something that we need to do collectively as a church family, as the body of Christ. If just one of us doesn't invest in others, it affects more than just ourselves. It affects the whole body. It means the rest of the body has to work harder to pick up the slack. Who are you investing in? And see, I think Paul got this idea of investment and discipleship so right. It is so much more than just kind of converting somebody, handing them a brochure and running off. It is developing a relationship with that person. It is doing life with them. Where are you doing this? Who are you doing this with? See, we can't wait for somebody else to make the first move. It's like when we're in small group and we say, all right, who wants to close us in prayer? And everybody's like, Oh, look at the time. I really hope Dave does it. He's, he's the guy that always picks up the prayer. Like, we, if we're all just sitting around waiting, we're going to be waiting a while. Who are you investing in? See, I think one of the biggest struggles we have with investing in others is kind of this overarching question of, am I good enough? Like, am I good enough? I feel like in today's world, we're constantly overanalyzing ourselves, comparing ourselves to other people on social media, whatever it may look like. We think, man, we see this person, it's like, ah, they've got it all together. Look how well they're doing in their career. Look how well they lead their family. Look at how many scriptures they've memorized. Man, I could never, I just couldn't do it. You know, I bet they even have more time than me. I'm really busy. I can't take time out of my schedule. I mean, really? You expect me to do that? And we just start playing this thing where we downplay ourselves so much to the point that we actually start believing, well, God can't use me. We start to lose faith in our ability to disciple others. But we have to recognize it's not really through our own strength that we do this. It's through God's. He is the one who does this. There's actually nothing that we could do to really qualify ourselves for this. So if you're feeling a bit disqualified, Same. (laughs) But Jesus is the one who qualifies us. It is God who does that for us and through us. It is through God's never-ending love and wisdom and strength that we are able to invest in others' lives. To point them to Jesus. To point them to the change maker. And do you know, do you remember what Paul was doing before he was preaching about Jesus? Before he was starting churches? He was killing Christians. He hated Jesus' followers so much that he wanted to kill them. He was present at the first martyrdom of Stephen, and he goes, yep, full support. That's who Paul was before this. So if you're feeling like, I don't know if I can do this, well, Paul wrote most of the New Testament, did some amazing things, touched a lot of lives, and is a wonderful example for discipleship, And he started off killing Christians. So if you're doubting your own ability, at least you're not a murderer. God can use Paul. He can use you. Do you remember the disciples? Jesus' core group of people? The people Jesus trusted to go out into the world and invest in others' lives the way that he invested in them? Well, they were just ordinary guys. They weren't anything special, yet they touched so many people's lives, led so many to Jesus. And because of Jesus' investment in them, they were able to invest in others. And what did this look like for Jesus? Well, he served them. One of the most amazing stories, in my opinion, in the whole Bible, is when Jesus washes the disciples' feet. As many of you know, this job was kind of reserved for the lowest of the low. Um, As you can imagine, people were stepping And some pretty funky stuff, like we don't even like feet now, and we keep them mostly clean. Um, So imagine the Son of God 
kneeling down at their feet and cleaning them. See, he did this because Jesus knew that in order to invest in somebody, you have to serve them. It's not about just being in charge. It's not about lording your authority. It's not about just saying, look at all these things that I know. Look how smart I am. That's not what it is. It's not even about fixing somebody because you actually can't fix them. You can't. You're the messenger. That responsibility is God, so don't burden yourself with that. You're the messenger. You point them to the one who can make the change. You point them to the change maker. Don't put that burden on yourself. See, it's about putting someone else before yourself. Who are you investing in? You are able to do this. Not because of your own personal strength, because, well, alone you are weak. But with God working through you, you are strong. God wants to transform you. So you can invest in others' lives. It's Jesus' whole model. Jesus invested in the 12 so they could go out and, and invest in others' lives. They eventually became the pioneers of the early church, leading thousands to Jesus. Investing in others is essential for the kingdom of Christ to grow. If we're not sharing the good news, how are they going to hear it? Who are you investing in? And how do we even begin this process? How do we work our way through this? Well, first thing's kind of obvious, but it's somewhat of a staple. And that's that we need to be transformed by the power of Jesus Christ. We need to be transformed by the power of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit needs to come into your life and transform your entire self. See, Paul could not have invested in Timothy if he had never been transformed by Jesus. It is pretty hard to lead somebody to Christ if you yourself do not know him. Um, so that's kind of the first thing. We need to allow Jesus to transform our lives. And what's great about him being in our lives is we now have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit leading us and guiding us, giving us wisdom, giving us peace, giving us confidence, giving us boldness. This is a powerful thing. Take the Apostle Peter, for example. This is the guy who denies Jesus three times one night. But he's end up killed because he won't stop talking about Jesus. How does that happen? He came into contact with the Holy Spirit and it transformed him. He became bold. He became courageous. And then I think something that's equally as important is we need to get plugged into a life group. We need to get plugged in with a community of believers. Here at the church, we call them life groups. And as the name suggests, it's doing life together. It's actually very simple. Um, It's a group of people coming together to do life with one another. Guys, we have to be in community with each other. We have to be in community with fellow believers. Trying to do this stuff all on our own, that's not really what we were meant to do. We were meant to be in community with with each other, supporting one another, encouraging each other, challenging each other. And life groups are an incredible way to do this. Just as Timothy had to make a decision to receive this guidance from Paul, we need to make a decision to receive investment from other believers. We need to give each other authority to speak into each other's lives. And that comes through relationship. That comes through community. Are you willing to do life with fellow believers and allow them to pour into you? Then, simply, we need to find somebody to invest in. we got to find somebody to invest in. So let's say you've gotten plugged in. You have this community of believers supporting you, encouraging you. Find somebody to invest in. Pray and ask God, okay, who in my life should I be meeting with? Who in my life should I be investing in? And I am confident he will give you a name. And I will even say, don't pray the prayer if you don't want it, because he'll give you a name. Spend time asking God to send someone your way, to bring somebody into your life that you can disciple. This is crucial. Ask God for this, and I'm confident you will receive it. When someone new comes into your life, maybe it's somebody already in your life, 
Invest in them. Disciple them. Build a relationship with them. You need to build a relationship with them. Remember what Paul did with Timothy? Paul took Timothy to different places with him. He ate with him. He prayed with him. He studied the scriptures with him. Follow this example. Spend time with this person. Go out to eat with them. Text them throughout the week. Send them funny pictures. Send them funny videos. It doesn't all have to be in the context of just scripture. Build a friendship with them. And what's important to remember is that we're not just trying to fix them. See, Paul, he didn't micromanage Timothy or just kind of lord his knowledge and authority over him. No, because we can't fix them. Jesus is the only one who can change our lives. We just point them to the one who can do it. Paul invested in Timothy because he genuinely cared for him. That is so key. Be authentic and intentional as you build this relationship. Lastly, send them to invest in somebody else. Send them to invest in somebody else. Continue the cycle of discipleship. Because of Paul's relationship with Timothy, he knew when it was time to challenge him in this area, to send him off. In Timothy's case, he ended up leading the church in Ephesus. Because of Paul's investment in Timothy, he ended up investing in the people of Ephesus. And this is exactly what Jesus did with his disciples. He served and developed them over the course of his ministry so they could go out and baptize people in the name of Jesus, making disciples of all nations. See, Paul's investment in Timothy gave him the skill set to invest in others and change their lives. And that is why we invest in others. For people to have a radical experience with Jesus and have him transform their lives. Who are you investing in? So you have the knowledge. You know about Jesus and you know what's required of you. And now you're left with a choice. You can choose to be like your friend who forgot about the compass. You can choose to keep this knowledge to yourself. Or you can be like Paul. You can intentionally invest your time and others sharing your love of Christ and knowledge of who he is with someone else. Your Timothy is out there. There is somebody who needs you. They are waiting for God to use someone like you to reach someone like them. And you may be worried if you can do this or not. But know that God is with you every step of the way. The Holy Spirit will give you wisdom, courage, the words, peace. He will be there alongside you. So don't hold yourself back anymore. Don't just sit back and say, well, there's nobody I can reach. I'm not good enough. I don't have enough time. I don't think I can do this right now. Maybe in a little bit. Don't. That is a lie from the enemy. Who are you investing in? Who around you needs to be introduced to Jesus? How can we as a church be known for developing authentic relationships? Let's come together as a church family and begin discipling one another. Who are you investing in? I mean, just imagine a church where everyone is looking for someone to disciple. It would be pretty hard to feel unloved in a place like that. I mean, just picture a church where you walk through the front door and immediately you just feel this authenticity, this intentionality, this love of Jesus, this group of people who are doing life together. And that's a church family. That's a wonderful picture of what Jesus wanted for his church. Do you want to be the friend who has the compass but still ends up lost in the woods. Never sharing your knowledge with the people who are around you, the people who need direction in their lives. Or will you be like Paul? Someone who not only passes down their knowledge, but chooses to invest in someone who needs guidance and develops a relationship, a friendship as a result. 
Who are you investing in? It's time to have an answer to that question. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for the opportunity to be able to just spread the good news that is you. Jesus, thank you for the encouragement that you can provide for us. Jesus, thank you for how you are with us every step of the way. And thank you for how you challenge us. Jesus, I pray that as we go from this place, as we go about our weeks, we would reflect on the challenge to invest in others. I pray that you would bring names to mind. I pray that you would encourage us. I pray that we wouldn't feel discouraged, but we would feel excited and rejuvenated and energized. Jesus, thank you that we just get to be a part of what you're doing. Thank you for allowing us to do that. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, church, as we move into this time of communion, I think it would be really neat if we could just reflect on the people who have poured into our lives and just thank Jesus for that. Say, Jesus, thank you for caring about me to put enough to put my name on someone else's mind. Thank you for sending somebody my way. Thank you for relationship. Thank you, Jesus. Let's make this a time where we give Jesus all the praise, all the glory, and all of the thanks for where we are today. So during this time of communion, let's reflect on that. Also, as you come forward to receive the elements, you'll see the two boxes up front. Um, and that's for tithe and offering, but that's reserved for those who call the fountain their church home. Uh, so those of you who are guests this morning, it's okay. You can just walk around by. It's all right. <laughs> and so whenever you guys are ready, you can come forward and receive the elements. Please stand and sing with us as we wrap up our time together this morning. Bring light to the dark.
without hope, no place to be. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given away. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace, so free, washes over me. You have made me new now. It begins with you. I just encourage you to live in that freedom this week and share that with those that you know. We love you guys, and we will see you next week.